Hello, everybody. Welcome to our episode of After Awakening with Lung P. Sander K. Madamo. Uh, Lung P, how are you doing today? Satu, Satu. I'm fine. It's uh, getting uh, a bit peaceful outside. It's, um, it's getting a little cooler. It's in the evening here. Great, great. And then you're in, where are you in the Netherlands? Uh, in the east, uh, in Afferden, which is a little village. Quite nice people, quite kind. And quiet, correct? Quiet yes. town. Quiet. quiet. Fantastic. Former Fantastic. Catholic Church. Yeah, Great. Former, formerly. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, everyone, um, we're here with Lone Peace Sander. Uh, Lo Lone Peace Sander, our Venerable Sander, has been ordained as a, as a Buddhist monk since 2005. So that's that's 16 years now at the at Wat Pra Dhammakaya, the Dhammakaya Temple in, in Thailand. He graduated with a master's from Radboud University in industrial organizational psychology. Um, the way Lumpy Sanders and I know each other uh, through the first 90-day meditation retreat that I did in, uh, in Thailand, it was initially in, out on the outskirts of Bangkok and then up into the mountains in Chiang Mai. And I was very young at the time. I was 19. It was the first uh, meditation, long meditation retreat that I've done. Uh, and it was a very, very difficult retreat for me. And Lung P. Sander was such a gracious teacher and he knew so much about Dhamma and, and Buddhism. And he just had a lot of wisdom um, even now, but at the time back then he, he did as well. And that was eight, eight years ago or so. So I was, yeah, I was, was, a long, was a while ago, nine years. Yeah, I think. Yeah. Not exactly. And you, and you were still, you were still so knowledgeable and, and helpful back then. So <laughs> I wanted to, I wanted to bring you on. Oh, they sorry. Find said... out. <laughs> <laughs> they couldn't find anyone, anyone else to speak English, right? Yeah, right, right. So they had to choose me. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, so 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 today I just wanted to get into into your life story a bit, um, what your journey was to to becoming a monk, and then I want to address some some questions about um, the Dhammakaya meditation technique and and the temple as well. I want to play devil's advocate with some of the controversies and, and accusations that have been thrown at, at, at the temple. And I, I know you, you've been a monk for a very long time and you're quite knowledgeable on all these affairs. So I'm excited to, uh, to really hear your story and uh, to hear the information that, that you have. When you were in university, getting a master's in, in industrial organizational psychology, uh, that's a career path that doesn't exactly look like it will transition into into be, becoming a Buddhist monk, uh, an ascetic, and really just leaving the world. How how did that happen? How did you go from you're on a track to being a HR supervisor to okay, I'm leaving all of this. I'm becoming a monk. What what happened? Yeah, well, um, I have to say um, before I. I encountered Buddhism, I was actually uh, studying art. So uh, um, when I encountered Buddhism, that actually led me to psychology. And you're right, uh, I know psychology is a bit of a different, it's like you're really aiming for a career, but it was more like I wanted to know everything about the common person, you know. I didn't, uh, I was less interested in, in, in people with illnesses, but but still, um, you know, I, I, I love all kind of psychology. Anyway, um, for me, this happened when I was actually uh, still uh, in, uh, in high school. I already started to read about Buddhism. And I remember there was this book uh, from, um, uh, it's called the Hero, of a Thousand, the Hero with a Thousand Faces by Joseph Campbell. Yeah which was a bit of a, a fashion book in, uh, in the, I think in the eighties. Uh, but uh, it was, uh, it was like my mother wanted to, you know, learn, have me learn about many things. So she bought this book for me. And then I, there was a lot of, about Buddhism in that book. Uh, and uh, later on, I, I, I also started to find old books that my mother once 
read in the time when you know in the hippie times in the 70s and about like the tibetan book of the dead i mean the the old one not the modern one so uh these were books that explained how you could by meditation learn not only yourself and become a more peaceful person but also l make be able to understand life and death you know so this was very fascinating to me and then i read books about the dalai lama who at that time wasn't really uh, as famous as he is now as well known and um yeah he explained about meditation uh, he wrote wrote about that and then you know meditation started to fascinate me so i started with that i started a meditation practice uh, about 15 minutes a day or something like that 15 and uh, um I actually uh, learned about a practice that I could, I focused on a little dot on the wall. <laughs> I read about that somewhere and it didn't really work. I couldn't really uh, learn the practice in a peaceful and comfortable way. So I started to look for a teacher and I went to look at several places uh, where I could learn meditation. And eventually I ended up with Dhammakaya. And then, you know, when I was became more involved, I became more interested in working for the temple as a volunteer. And as I was working for the temple as a volunteer for about uh, 20 months, then I decided to, that I wanted to become a monk. Wow, so you had stayed in Thailand for an entire, entire 20 months before you ordained? Um, actually not. Uh, I stayed in Thailand for about eight months and then another year in uh, Belgium in the temple there. So, so what was that that decision like for you? Was it? Do you feel that you just woke up, or did you just wake up one day and you and you knew it was it was time to to ordain, or and did you have any intention that you would that you would do it for this long, or did you just want to see what it was like? Yeah, I get the question often from why, what made you decide to become a monk? But for me, it doesn't feel like that. It feels more like why did you decide to embrace Buddhism. And then as a natural result, you want to do this full time. So for me, the main step, the main change in my life was when I started to become fascinated and wanted to practice Buddhism. So I read as much as I could about it, which wasn't as much as, as it is today. It's, it was kind of hard to find good books in those days about Buddhism. And um, yeah, I, I really started to practice this. And, and, and also people around me started to say that I was changing. Uh, I, I didn't really know uh, um, how to practice it in detail, but I tried to, to, to really get to understand uh, the, the Buddhist uh, practice and theory. And then what really fascinated me was the, the emphasis on, on, on how the mind works and, and that it's, about human beings, you and me, people like me. How do you know suffering and overcome suffering? It's not about um, um, we have to devote our lives to this higher intelligence or that higher intelligence. It, it wasn't based on abstract principles. It was based on the experience here and now. And um, yeah, they did also the fact the emphasis on ethical training yourself ethically and in, in, in good virtue and good character that, you know, it was really practical. And that really appealed to me. It really felt like this was about, this was a philosophy that really made sense. Uh, you might call it the religion, but whatever the case, it made a lot of sense to me. Yeah. I remember in, in, in MMC, you had shared a story about how you were in in university, and um, someone had asked you why you had believed, why you believe in 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 a uh, in Nirvana, in in enlightenment. What was your what was your answer to that to that question, and how did how did you handle that at the time, when you're you're moving in this specific direction and you had quite a few people that thought it was weird. Spirituality and meditation is very popular now, but um, yeah, when, you were, yeah. when you were getting into it, it was it was not. Now all the CEOs do it, but back then yeah, it was right. weird. Back then, back then, especially in Holland, it was still 
like if you were meditating, you were probably also hugging trees or something, you know. It was <laughs> it was really uh, that kind of thing. I mean, there was I remember there was a minister, um, not a Christian minister, but a minister, minister as in ministry of the government. Uh, she was actually very much interested in very much into Tibetan Buddhism at the time, and she was laughed about it and mocked about it all the time. I mean, if you would do that. Now it's like, well, you know, Buddhism is okay. <laughs> it was, it wasn't really um, considered a real religion by many people. They th just thought it was a sort of new age thing or something like that. And um, I remember I wrote an article in a in a in a, in a journal uh, from the university from the university's church actually to be exact and that was about very had a very religious tone in it it was about how to devote your life to goodness and to really become a good person and also about the impermanence of life and you know the basic tenets of buddhism were in there but it was really about my also about my own life and i remember one of the um uh christian um he was actually a, a, a monk or monastic, but he was also the, the priest of that church. He said, you know, I used to think that it was a sort of hobby, that Buddhism of yours. But now you, you really convince me that it's a real thing. <laughs> I remember that very well. Wow. Of course, I was convinced I was doing the right thing already, but it just surprised me that he came with that, you know. Most of the time... People didn't really understand it and thought I was either some form of Christian or something because I dressed up or neatly and all that. You know, most people in psychology they, they they look a little bit sloppy sometimes, but you know, it's it's a free, it's more liberal style, you know. And because I dressed dressed up a little neatly, I was sometimes you know understood to be like a person from the province, probably a little bit Christian type or something. So most people didn't even know that I was Buddhist. But when people ask me, why don't you drink? You know, then I would say, I don't drink because of my religious beliefs. I'm a Buddhist. And then that would sometimes lead to interesting conversations, you know, which were good, positive, you know. And um, I think I'm lucky in the sense that Holland is a very open country and tolerant. We, at that time, uh, Holland maybe didn't know so much about Buddhism, but still people were open to it. And uh, they they kind of were afraid of the commitment that I'd taken. That kind of scared them off. But they were okay with the basic philosophy, you know. How was shifting from a scientific worldview that you had uh, with, with your education in Holland how how was navigating that when you had gone to Thailand become a monk and there's this entire Buddhist cosmology and um, many many ideas that are that are considered unscientific was that was that an issue for you at the start or did you not have a problem with that? Yeah, well, I don't think I was very uh, raised very scientific. Um, it, but my parents were more or less atheist. I mean, they weren't really uh, uh, against Christianity, but they were not religious. Uh, both of them were in the previous times in the seventies. They were they were uh, communist actually, mm. but they you know later on they they developed their view. They they changed their views, and communism wasn't really a thing anymore in Holland. But um, um, anyway, um, to 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 make a long story short, it was actually, uh, yeah, it was. It, there were some things that uh, you know it was kind of uh, like the the, the 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 belief in karma. I could I could connect with that, but the belief in the in the in the afterlife and all that that was a little odd for me. Reincarnation and all that. I just, you know, I just had the, the, I think I had, I was lucky in the sense that I met Lompi Nicolas, who was one of my teachers at that time. And he kind of said, if there's anything just that you don't believe, just, just give it the benefit of the doubt. He was kind of open in that sense. 
Wow. So this is the Buddhist way. We 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 do not uh, discard anything. We just give it the benefit of the doubt. Uh, and if you don't believe it yet, then it's okay. You know, he was kind of uh, open in that sense. And um, yeah, other Thai monks as well. Uh, other Thai monks, uh, other monks that uh, some some of the Thai monks they also, you know, they told me don't worry about it. You know, it's it's the the practice that counts and. And you 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 can you know give yourself some time to reconsider things. At a certain point, I became. Um, there's a lot of things that I have to do with faith, you know. And eventually, the faith that you have in Buddhism it kind of rises from the practice. You know, this is working. So if this is working, there must be some someone who came up with this who's pretty intelligent. And then you eventually you start to, well, it's not just, it's not a fairy story. There's a real Buddha there. Uh, there's a real uh, person there who really attained something. You, you kind of start to, to really believe it. That's how it went in my case. And uh, so, so I don't, yeah, I don't feel that was a big struggle though. I think it was at a certain point because I didn't know yet that those feelings and those doubts are very common mm. and very well accepted in, in the Buddhist past. Even for Thai monks, they, they, they accept, well, you, you, you have come from a very different culture and different beliefs as normal. Then they, they were okay with that. So uh, there's no articles of faith in Buddhism. You know, you, faith is more like a sort of result of your practice. And you you can't just decide on faith. Yeah, I'm going to have a lot of faith today. You can't do that. It's not like that. It's not. <laughs> it's not like you you switch it on or something. Right, right. Well, uh, I'm I'm very fascinated by the your your understanding and grasp of of uh, Buddhist history and and Buddhist modernism in in Thailand. Uh, one of our our earlier private conversations was was discussing how the current meditation practices and techniques that are popular in Thailand that was the result of a of a Buddha and of, of a Buddhist modernist uh, revolution or, or transition could you could you talk about that a bit how how we've come to the current state of um, of Theravada in in Thailand so um, as you will probably discuss in more detail with uh, dr. Kate Crosby in the later episode, um, I uh, there is a certain moment very important to the to the uh, history of Buddhism, especially Theravada Buddhism, and to uh, some extent or to a high extent also in, in in Japanese Buddhism. There's this period when Buddhism had to negotiate with the modern age. It had to find a new way to present itself to be still be relevant. And uh, in order to do that, uh, you know, for Buddhism, especially in Thailand, it had to come up with a way that it looked modern. And there was a tendency at that time in Thailand, and I'm talking about the end of the 19th and the beginning of the 20th century, to really want to present itself as modern. And so that uh, Western nations wouldn't be inclined to, to, to colonize Thailand. So that you know, this this was a result of a long process, and it culminated in the in the reform of Buddhism. Now that took place in Sri Lanka much earlier, but in Thailand, that took place uh, during the 20th century mostly. And uh, in in the city tradition, uh, this was mostly uh, it was translated as in many ways but one of the ways was that there was a standard meditation practice which today we know as in the west as vipassana but in asia is more well, better known by the word burmese method or satipatthana method now that was a standard method and it was issued like that from the 40s or 50s in thailand this is going to be the standard meditation you all have to go and do this and uh, this, there was a, just an example. There were many ways in which uh, Buddhism was, uh, they tried to really modernize. And sometimes it's called, the, some scholars, they call it the self-colonization project of Thailand. They wanted to, to, to like modernize it so that Western nations wouldn't have the feeling this country needs help. 
<laughs> which 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 was where it also happened to many other countries like Turkey or or uh, um, uh, many other Asian countries. Yeah. So during this Buddhist Theravada Buddhist modern modernist period or during this during this transition, Long Bu was uh, the founder of the the rediscover of the Dhammakaya meditation technique was was living and and teaching this method um what what was it like revealing this knowledge and teaching a new discovery in in the buddha in the buddhist dharma at the time because when when anyone makes a new discovery and begins to propagate it it, it upsets the standing scholastic and, and monastic community how how did that how did that unfold and do you think that's related to the story of the dhammakaya temple moving into the future yeah yes and no i mean it was obvious that um Lompu did come up with many renovations it is obvious now to us today uh, that the Lompu was uh, very uh, he made a lot of renovations to to meditation at that time, but that is only relevant. That is that is very uh, natural for us to understand it that way right now. But in those days, Lopu, we have to understand he used most of the language of meditation as it was known in those days, especially um, from the Visuddhimagga. He used a lot of that language, and he even used a few terms from the Satipatthana Sutta, uh, so as to 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 present his meditation form uh, in a similar fashion as other traditions. So he wasn't really like uh, uh, I'm the new person here, but I'm the new. I have a nov I have a new thing here. That was not really how he presented it. But the, the new thing was the word Dhammakaya, which was not used for a meditation method before that time, as far as we know. And uh, um, yeah, there, there is, uh, there is, so there were some, some, there's, there is some, there was some resistance that some people felt that he was, uh, yeah, that he was not uh, following the modern reforms, you know, he wasn't practicing the, Burmese method, for example, and uh, so so he he did uh, uh, attempt to modernize the education system in the local area. So he wasn't against modernism; the opposite. I mean, he used uh, a lot of modern methods of management. In fact, in fact, which makes you wonder where he learned those things in those days. But but uh, yeah, he was a very modern person in the sense, but. Uh, he his meditation method really was rooted in the ancient practices, which were not part of the reform. And what were those techniques? So uh, before he uh, started to teach the Makai meditation, he actually had practiced several techniques, including uh, the, the the breathing meditation, which we know today as uh, you know the sati. Uh, sorry, the anapanasati. Uh, breathing meditation. Uh, he also practiced uh, some <clears throat> techniques in which you imagine a sphere of light outside of yourself. <clears throat> and um, he also practiced some other techniques in which you follow certain, uh, certain uh, positions in the body, but uh, different from what he would teach later. So it's like he, he combined a lot of methods the sphere which he imagined previously outside of himself, he then brought inside of himself, and he used the 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 basis which were taught in several techniques at that time, but he he put those bases along the breath the breath, which the was not common the, before the, time, the pathway of the breath. So it's like he combined all all of, at least three and maybe even more methods into one. And then he came up with this, this wonderful new uh, thing that wasn't known, well, probably wasn't known, we don't know that, but what is very unlikely to have been known before that was that he 
discovered that there is this pathway within. If you combine it in the right way, as I mentioned before, then, <clears throat> then there is actually a, <clears throat> a pathway within uh, in which your mind then travels inside your, your body. And then he would, um, yeah, that, that was his, his discovery of the, the middle way that he, he would say that this is a different meaning of the middle way uh, as, a, as an inner path that exists within. And um, so, so he actually came then with the teaching of the inner bodies or, or the inner, um, the supramundane states that actually existed inside the, the human self. And based on this discovery of, of these inner bodies and the, the Dhammakaya bodies, Longpu pronounced uh, that, there, that there was a true self. And could you, could you talk about this notion of true self and no self, in, specifically in Theravada Buddhism? There's a tendency, mainly a theme in, in the Burmese tradition and in the forest tradition that, that there's, absolutely, <laughs> there's absolutely no self. But... Um, you think otherwise? What what are your what's your opinion and understanding of this? So there's there's two things here. First of all, uh, that the Buddha taught that there is no self that is actually uh, debated. I mean, it's a contentious issue. It's not uh, that everyone believes that. Um, it's um, well, there is, there is no clear evidence that the Buddha actually taught that there is no self at all. Because normally, the way the Buddha would teach, he would emphasize experience, the experience of the individual, what you're experiencing now, and he would say what you perceive, what you reflect on, you know, all the different parts of your human experience, of your experience, the aggregates, as we call them, or the kanta, we, they are all not self because they are subject to change. They are, they are not really satisfactory. They're not really giving us happiness. You, know, you think about a car, you want a big car, and then you think about it, that is not self. Why? Because the car, you don't really own it. So all your thoughts and how they connect to the world, they are not really ourselves. So the and the matter, the the rupa in which it connected to in the world, it's not really ourself, it's not really ours. That is all that is all a uh, shared belief. That is also what Dhammakaya teaches, what Dhammakaya Temple teaches, and what Rumpuwa Patnam taught. And to be honest, most of the time, uh, in many actually in many discourses, I wouldn't say most of the time, but in many places. Lumpu talks about the not self a lot, that you have to let go because of the not because uh, this is not self, that is not self. It's not like he he, he doesn't think that's important. That's very important. But uh, then he says something that is very uh, that is a little farther. <laughs> he then continues by saying that the Buddha he taught not self. He taught. Uh, he taught um, uh, impermanence and he taught uh, suffering, uh, that there is an unsatisfactory nature in the world, uh, in the things in the world. In order for us to find the true self, the permanent and the true happiness, now the the part where he talks about permanence and true and true happiness, that is not so controversial. The the part where he talks about the true self, that is very that was in those days was a little controversial and it's controversial now. But uh, he would ex he would simply uh, uh, so so he would. Most of the time, he was talking a lot about not self. I mean, it's not like he was uh, going against uh, all the tenets of, so, of Buddhism, but he 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 added. He said that this is something that the Buddha actually wanted us to discover. Now you can ask the question: If the Buddha really taught that, then why isn't it mentioned in the Buddhist text? Right. Exactly. Well, 
Well, the, the thing is that uh, the Buddha would normally uh, emphasize, describe nirvana in negative terms. So we'd say there's only two things, two things that I've been teaching. Formerly and now I teach only two things, suffering and the end of suffering. And the end of suffering is what we have come to understand as the path to nirvana and the actual attainment of nirvana. So, so um, he 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 you know he he recognized uh, that, but uh, the Buddha he talked about uh, the nature of nirvana mostly in negative terms. So he would say that uh, it's not this, it's not that, it's the unborn, it's the unaging, or, or some similar term and terminology. And um, so uh, basically what Lombu was saying is that the Buddha didn't mention it because he wanted people to find it for themselves. And that is what he literally says, actually. Uh, but Lompu did believe that this was what the Buddha actually had intended for us to attain that there is a true self. So it's so, like, yeah, it's it's like he, the Buddha wanted people not to grasp to this true self as it was taught in, in, in Brahman or ancient Hindu tradition as this true self or this, uh, this, 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 this great self to which a human, this great God or a true God or a true self with, with, with the true self will then unite with the true God or something like that. That entire philosophy was not really what he wanted to teach. Uh, to put it philosophically, he didn't want to teach uh, what was out there. He wanted to, to, to have people stick to their experience. Uh, he was teaching a way to salvation or, or, or um, inner uh, liberation not uh, what's out there. He wasn't teaching metaphysics. So there was right. no real point to start to describe Nirvana. It's like this, it's like that. That wasn't his attention. So he simply, uh, he simply, uh, the Buddha, he simply s s stick to what, what was there in our experience right now. And uh, we then aim for not suffering. And but Lombu, he kind of, he kind of like he interpreted this. This, this is actually the true self. There is a true self out. There is a true self that you can find. It's not out there, but mm. it's inside. Uh. <laughs> well, only uh, not very much of Lombu's writings are translated into English. Correct? Only, only Vasudhivacha, yeah. Volume One and Two. That's right. Okay, so so from your understanding of, of Thai and being able to read what, what Long Fu wrote directly, did he describe Nibbana? Yeah, and he what did. It was like? He did, but he did in the context of teaching meditation to his students. Uh, so so he would tell that if you come to this stage of meditation, you should uh, uh, see, you should try to explore this or explore that he would explain this in chapters some of these chapters were written by his students some of them were were transcribed from his talks but um they were all um written or 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 written down under his supervision so this is really his work and then yeah there is um it's kind of difficult to understand intellectually so at some there is actually uh, some times when he says that uh, that it's not like you would understand it like this, or it's not. It's like he. It's kind of. It, it's very difficult to understand intellectually, and I don't think that it was intended that way. I think it was really intended like you have a guideline to practice. So if you're in meditation and you're seeing this now, then you move to that. You move to that, or something like that, and. Uh, so, so that most of the time, what he would be teaching to the to the people and to the monks at large, not in the context of teaching meditation, but in the context of a general introduction to meditation or teaching Buddhist doctrine, Buddhist theory, he would simply say there is the the there is a nirvana, 
we can attain it uh, through the through the uh, supramundane states inside of us, or, or this nirvana is uh, is is a part of that. Yeah. So, so if the uh, heavenly realms in Buddhist cosmology and and in the universe are a part of samsara, we could see that as being within the matrix, right? And attaining nibbana, nirvana is you're out of the matrix. What was Lung Bu's description and understanding of this? And is it at all similar to the Buddha fields or Buddha lands that are described in the Mahayana and Vajrayana texts? Well, um, you're talking about the Buddha fields as in uh, uh, Amitabha or something like that, Amitabha, the Amitabha Buddha or something similar? Yeah, th th there's, there's descriptions in the Mahayana canon of, of Buddhas existing in this in this pure dimension where their mm. disciples exist around them. Was it, is this at all similar to what is in, in Long Bu's descriptions of Nibbana? Uh, it, you could say there is some similarity. He just did describe Nirvana as, as a sort of place where, where you could, uh, you, where the Buddha would sit and uh, there would be many people sitting there. But um, the idea that you could, uh, as it exists in, in many forms of Mahayana Buddhism, especially in the Pure Land tradition, that you could devote yourself to one of these places, uh, one of the uh, um, Pure Lands, and then you could you could get a shortcut in that way to Nirvana. He wouldn't teach that, no. but he he simply taught that the Nirvana. Uh, is not an abstract. It's, it's not. It, it, it is complicated, but he would he would describe it in a certain way, like like you said, like a, there is actually a Buddha sitting somewhere. But um, there's other passages in which he kind of uh, makes it clear that it's beyond our intellectual comprehension. So it's yeah, it's kind of like you don't know exactly what he means. Right, absolutely. But to but to make this this kind of uh, discovery and, and to be propagating it, saying uh, the center of the body is the pathway to the actual super mundane Nibbana as, as dimension and reality, that's, uh, would you say that's, that's still something that most Theravadan scholars do not agree or sit well with? Yeah, that's that's very controversial. But but we have to realize that there's many things that many uh, teachers in the forest tradition or in other traditions have said that do not agree with theory. Mm, okay. I mean, there there have been ajans in the forest tradition describing nirvana as well, which doesn't really match with what is what you know. It's not it's not it cannot be backed up with with theory. So, so in the ancient times, in the old times, there was this, well, at the time of Long Bu, in fact, it was common for, for a Buddhist teacher to sometimes describe things which were his experience, which were part of the patibat, patipati, not the pariyati. Kind of like saying, well, if you want to know more, practice like me, practice every day. Don't be lazy. You know, that was the point. It wasn't the point to start an intellectual debate about the nature of nirvana, because that that is pariyati. And by when pariyati, when it came to pariyati, the theory, the the learning, the 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 text, Lopu was very straightforward, and he he cited texts all the time. Mm -hmm. So it's not like he 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 went against the theory of Buddhism or something. It's just that he. At certain points in time, you would say, this is a meditation experience that I'm teaching you. If you want to know more, practice like I do. And that is not very different from what many Ajans did in the past. They would sometimes say things or they would, some would even cry when they said they experienced this or that. Not cry like sad, but cry from joy. And, and then, you know, not because uh, this or that uh, you you this is the theory or something it's just that 
uh, there was something there and you, you you have to really practice to get there and it's it's worthwhile it's the reason why we've ordained you know right don't don't just don't uh, just sit there and, and do nothing. We have to really make an effort. This is was kind of the style of the ancient Thai masters. There was this this distinguished. Uh, I teach you teach the theory, and then you also mention a few things of the practice. Well, if you practice more and more, you will also experience uh, this or that, and you know that wasn't really an issue, uh, but it became an issue later on. In the present day, there is a lot of intellectual debate. Yeah, but um, at the time uh, there was some controversy, but not much in the time of Longpo. Okay, so so now, so now I'm putting on the the devil's advocate hat to to address some of the the accusations and and concerns that have been been launched at at the temple. Really, um, one of them, for example is that our temple, the Dhammakaya temple is overly materialistic and that their aim of uh, people generating kama so that they can be reborn in, in, um, in the fourth heaven to further their cultivation. This is not Theravada Buddhism. This is not in accordance with the text. What, are your, what is your answer to that? Yeah, there's, so there's two things here. First of all, there is what Lompat, the Machiyo, and Lompat, the Dativo. So for those uh, outsiders who are listening to these to these videos, those are our teachers, right? So there is uh, Kunyaya Tan, who, who received the teaching from Lompo Wapaknam that we previously mentioned. And then he passed on this teaching to Lompat, the Machiyo, and Lompat, the Dativo, who are our teachers now these days. And both of them are explain the Buddhist teaching in a certain way. And then there is a, a culture in the temple which arises at a certain point, and also there is a Bangkok culture. Uh, we're talking about a, a city which is its own country, you know. And this is this is where most of Thailand lives. And um so there is, of course, an element of materialism because everywhere in Bangkok there is materialism. You cannot find any corner where there is not materialism in Bangkok. Which is probably the logical effect of getting everyone in one single city in the country. I mean, no other country has that to that extent, or hardly any other country. So there is that. Okay, I'm not saying that Bangkok people are wrong or something. I'm just saying this is part of what Bangkok is. But it's very clear that if we look at what our teachers have taught and what they have practiced, there's nothing to do with uh, materialism. In fact, uh, most of our uh, lay people who come to our temple for years, they know this very well. They will say, okay, I'd like to give because I would like to, to attain, I would develop paramis, develop good qualities. And as a part of that, I would also like to be financially stable, financially wealthy, but uh, that is only a tool. In the words of Lompata Machio, everything in the world, all matter, is, a sh is shared property. There is actually, when you look at it on, from really deeply, there is no individual property in this world because when you die, you have to leave it behind. So, so oh, uh, property is just a tool, in his words, is just a tool to develop goodness. That is what he said. So when somebody comes to the temple for a while, they will understand that and they will look at um, all forms of uh, wealth as tools but there is a lot of uh, teachings in buddhism that really point out that the buddha did really support and want people to be wealthy but there was some people who chose the more meditative path some lay people we have lay teachers in the time of the Buddha, there were some lay teachers 
who did not uh, choose to become a wealthy patron or a wealthy benefactor of Buddhism. But the general, most uh, of the students uh, with, of the Buddha, he uh, did encourage to be generous and to practice generosity and to use their wealth for to improve Buddhism. But uh, um, so, so there is some uh, um, element of materialism in that sense that in Buddhism, there is an idea that wealth is not wrong per se. It's not wrong in itself. And in that sense, Buddhism uh, is uh, stronger than other, uh, I think many other religions. So um, uh, wealth is seen as a tool, but you have to, as, as the Buddha says, uh, you have to learn to, to, to use it in the right way by using it for your for not only for your own benefit but most importantly for the benefit of society uh, for example charity sh giving to charity giving to your friends and family and giving to a good cause as well a religious cause uh, in in this context of his teaching so uh, um so he would teach that you have to be generous using your wealth generosity gen in a generous way not keep it uh, for yourself or just uh, and also the other thing is that you have to learn that one day you're going to have to let go of this wealth so there is no real uh, no real idea that you have to that you honor wealth per se you honor wealth in itself which would um, that there may be people who come to our temple uh, since our temple has many people from bangkok there's going to be a few that misunderstand this and they, they will maybe come to the temple and brag or something, but these people are everywhere. I mean, <laughs> there's always people who are more materialist than others, but uh, in generally, and which you can see in the culture of both our, our teachers and those who have been practicing coming for the temple for a long time. The important thing is that you learn to practice, to give. And uh, if you give a little, then you give a little. If you give more, then you give more. You practice in order to, to be joyous in the giving. Even as a monk, uh, in our temple, we encourage every monk to whatever gift you have been given to share, you know. And uh, that is uh, always a great thing to do, and it's a practice. If somebody doesn't do that, it's kind of frowned upon, you know, if somebody is in the habit of being stingy or something. But um, uh, at the same time, um, uh, we, we cannot simply say that people who are poor or, or something uh, or disadvantaged, uh, that, that they have always, uh, you, you know, that they deserve that because they have done, uh, didn't do good karma in the past or something. There is no sense of deserving in, in the law of karma. It's just something that happens. And. We don't know what people have done in the past, and we cannot make any judgments about that. Right. There's this idea that uh, that's propagated in the Thai media that if you're if you're poor, you can't come to the Dhammakaya Temple. And I've been there many times, and there's no there's no security guard at the at the front gate checking <laughs> how much money you have. <laughs> no. Everyone, everyone's allowed allowed into the temple. Yeah, it's, uh, it's uh, yeah, that's no problem. Yeah, so uh, there's a general concept, a, bit, a little bit romantic, in in Thailand that a, a temple to be a real Buddhist temple, it must be old and and decrypt. What do you call it? Uh, defunctional, or you know, it must be falling apart, and the, the the abbot must must be walking with a walking stick and preferably be more older than 70 years and you know it's it's a bit of a romantic idea and you know and um, you know in, in thailand uh, most journalists uh, they are not above they are most of them are not above 30 years old so just <laughs> and, and what about this this aim of of Dhammakaya to to pursue merits and and to accrue perfections um qualities in this life and then be reborn in in a heavenly realm where you can continue to pursue um pursue the dhamma what's your your take on that not being in accordance with with buddhism because as far as i i can see that's exactly what 
Shakyamuni, Sakyamuni, the Buddha did in his previous lifetimes as a Bodhisattva, Bodhisattva, he pr pursued perfections and, and accrued merits. Why is it Theravada takes this point of view that um, if if our path is towards our hardship and, and enlightenment and in accordance with the scriptures, that's that's not what we're supposed to be doing. These, both paths exist. They don't they don't bite each other. They don't go against. Uh, so there is a path where you develop good qualities in the process of becoming enlightened. And uh, in order to do that, you need to do uh, goodness, like generosity, but also keeping the precepts and meditating and learning the Dhamma, learning the Buddhist teachings. There's this process in which you try to upgrade your life in every lifetime. There is that. There is that uh, teaching known in Buddhism. The Buddha even says that if you, uh, if you want to be born in heaven, then you have to get... Uh, you have to practice both generosity, a moral life, and meditation because you take care of every part of your character in that way. And how the life you have lived, that is how you die. We die the life we lived. I think you can remember that quote from the, from the retreat, right, <laughs> in Thailand. So, um, um, yeah, so, so that's, uh, that's certainly part of Buddhism. Yeah, that's certainly part. But there is a tendency in, in modern Buddhism, which uh, I believe it was Cousins, uh, a, a British scholar who has recently passed away, who said that, uh, uh, I don't know, I think he recently passed away. Yes, I'm, I'm not pretty sure of that. Who said that he spoke about ultimatism, like a tendency in, uh, in, in Thai Buddhism to only emphasize awakening and... Uh, and this is, of course, also part of uh, modernist Buddhism to, to emphasize the, the, the reflection, the intellectual, and the, 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 the emphasis on awakening. Yeah. So, so that there is a very unique identity, which is different from Christianity or something like that. Or, you know, it's, 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 it's a modern interpretation. But if you look at traditional Buddhism as it had always been, karma and doing good karma has always been very important. You know, there's Western people coming to Thai temples, and I'm not just talking about Dhammakaya, any Thai temple, many Thai temples. And they look down on those Thai people, you know, Thai, Thai people don't get anything about meditation. They just talk about merit, merit, merit. But that's 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 all part of the process. Merit, one meaning of merit is purification. You're 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 doing good in order to, to purify yourself inside out, to be a better person, to be a more beautiful person inside. And eventually then meditation also needs to be part of that, of course, but if somebody does only part of the path, it's still good. <laughs> it's, still, it's still better than nothing. <laughs> Absolutely. And then there are many, many just countless references in the, in the suttas to to merit and, and its value. One of them in particular is that if a, if you find a monk, I believe, or if you encounter a monk who's been, who's just exited or come out of a deep state of meditation, a jhana, and you offer him food or alms, then the merit of that offering is, is, is higher. And if, and if it was a monk who, who's been in meditation for seven days, some extraordinary amount of time like that, just seated there, then the merit is even is even <laughs> even greater. So is, is is that accurate? This is in the scriptures, correct? Uh, yeah, that's true. But uh, I would have to uh, add to that that it was a person who was actually in a seven day continuous meditation. So that's for twenty four hours, seven days. Yes. Um, this is still still a practice in some parts of Thailand. When some, but you know, if you say that, maybe people will think I'm crazy. <laughs> So uh, anyway, uh, it's it's okay. Uh, we can. There's many guests that talk about all kinds of <laughs> unusual things on this show. So so, right. <laughs> so so don't don't, and, don't and, worry and about that. Another thing is that the gift was also difficult. So the person giving the gift in most of these example stories uh, was also uh, difficult to give that gift. For example, a part of his food, and he didn't have much food, and he gave part of his own food something like that. 
Wow. Usually, uh, many Buddhist stories about generosity are, in fact, about poor people. And we know uh, from uh, from the Buddhist text that the Venerable Mahakasapa was in the habit of receiving mostly from poor people, because in that way he wouldn't get attached to the to the honor that was bestowed upon him when he would receive gifts from the rich. So it's it's not like um, I'm, I'm not saying that Buddhist is, is against wealth, but it, there's also a place for people who have who are facing hardship. Right, a absolutely. And and not to address some of the the accusations and and scandals that have that have plagued uh, plagued the Dhammakaya temple. How did how did all this begin? How did the media campaign and the media smear actually start? And and why? Well, there's a there's a there's an external cause and an internal cause. I mean, the internal cause is that our temple in, in the previous times, we used to be a little bit, uh, we were a little bit naive. We didn't know much what was what people thought outside of our temple. There was, there was too much of a cleft between, I mean, too much of a space between the people in the temple and how they were thinking and the people outside the temple. I don't think the, we were ever a cult or something that's not, certainly not the case. We were a very healthy and uh, well-functioning uh, temple within the Thai uh, uh, monastic establishment, uh, Thai monastic uh, community. But there, there have been times when our temple was a little bit more isolated than now. And that may have been part why we didn't understand the concerns of the people outside the temple. That is one thing. And part of the problem is that we didn't explain who we were, where we believed in, what we believed in, part of that problem. So we didn't always engage in the debate. When people criticize you, we always, in the, especially in the, in, the, in, the, in the 90s, I was there uh, at the end of the 90s, at least, uh, when, when our temple still had the philosophy when we are criticized, when the temple is criticized, don't respond, don't fight back, but also don't run away, which is one of the ideas that Lumpu Wapaknam taught. But I, we don't know exactly what, <laughs> if he meant that, you know, maybe in some cases you do need to respond. Uh, so, so um, uh, whatever the case, uh, that was the internal cause. There was, there's always a uh, internal, there is some, Part, you know, I'm not saying that our temple is perfect in every sense. If that was the case, we wouldn't need to teach anyone because everyone was enlightened. So um, the other uh, cause is external. At the time when we were criticized, when we came on a lot of criticism and scrutiny was during the late 90s. At that time, uh, Asia was facing one of the biggest crises it, it has ever seen the 1997 financial crisis. And uh, we were very happily building a Chedia, building an, an enormous monument in the middle of the financial crisis. Made of pure gold. Which is, I mean, which is exactly the style of Lampata Machayo. I mean, you, can, you, can't, you can't say, well, he wasn't behind that, or people were just coming up with their own ideas. No, no, he, he, that's his style. When you are in problems, you solve it with goodness. You, you do, when you are uh, facing hardship, you give more. It, it, it sounds contradictory, but that's how uh, our Lompata Machayo thinks, you know. But of course, people outside, they didn't get it. Why do you need to build such a huge building uh, to, to, in the middle of the financial crisis, people are getting fired every day, you know. So, so he didn't, that was a misunderstanding there. And also our temple grows very quickly. And um, part of that process uh, is that, you know, we, we, yeah, we, we are noticeable. Uh, like there's a proverb uh, in, in Dutch language, high trees, they catch more wind. And uh, we were becoming very high trees in the late 90s.
we had uh, people from the both the ro royalty and uh, the uh, influential figures from the from from Thai politics and other parts of Thai society who came to our temple regularly. We were becoming very noticeable. So at that time, there was some criticism. Um, another thing is that um, our temple, in many ways, you could say, is sort of a Theravana tradition-based temple using Mahayana methods to spread Buddhism, which doesn't fit in with Thailand as it right. is in the as it mostly is. In Thai people, most of Thai people, they prefer a temple which is very quiet, has few people, and preferably uh, it looks old and, you know, as I mentioned. Um, but, um, but uh, you know, Damakai looks very modern. It is a huge organization. Uh, it, it looks uh, like Space more like age, a... even. <laughs> really, it yeah, looks more like a, like a complex than a temple, and this this is uh, appealing to many people in Bangkok, but to outside of Bangkok, maybe sometimes they don't understand. So it's a lot. A lot of it is about appearance and uh, preconceptions about what Buddhism should be like. For example, if you would, uh, I, I'm pretty sure that if you would transplant Dhammakaya, to theoretically, of course. To Taiwan, you would would be quite unnoticeable. I mean, absolutely unnoticeable. In, in Taiwan, there is many huge Buddhist organizations which are very modern and have all sorts of engagement in society, and that is very fairly common there. It's also a country which is a lot more democratic than Thailand, by the way, but that may also be related to it. So, um, so when um, our temple is a very large organization like this. That's going to be noticeable. You know, it's going to attract both critics and people who praise the temple. And uh, but if yeah, if you if you want to get more concrete, you have to look at what the what uh, the criticism is. But um, of course, there is criticism when you have a large uh, temple like that. Are you are you willing to get into the kind of political scandals behind it and the abbot um, being arrested and all of that that happened in the late nineties? Yeah, sure, that that's possible, but it's a long time ago. But yeah, it's possible, sure. Sure. What 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 happened in that in that instance, and how and how is it related to this recent? Um, military junta where the members of the Thai Piku Council were, were arrested. These are two. Okay, two. Well, yeah, there's, there's, there's three things here. There is, there's, well, when you could say there's two things. There is the temple and there is the rest of the monastic uh, establishment. Uh, the recent, uh, the recent uh, in recent times, there were several uh, monks from the monastic establishment in Thailand arrested. Uh, and uh, eventually most of them were released again, but uh, they were detained for about a, about a little over a year, I think, without a due process. So that's also, that's <laughs> Thailand 101 for you. So, Crazy. Um, um, yeah, so, so um, that happened, but that didn't really relate to our temple directly, but it, there is a, uh, there's a connection in that um, these monks were perceived, as has been well documented by journalists and scholars, were especially journalists, they were perceived as being red, so supportive of pro-democracy movements in Thailand. And uh, um, that's why they were arrested. They were not perceived as supporting the government, the Thai junta at that time. So that is the, the the reason why those monks were arrested. That was uh, uh, that was uh, a few years ago. Yeah, but um, the uh, I think that was 2017, if I'm not mistaken, or either 2017 or 18. Yeah, in I, I remember it was the month May. Maybe it was 16. 
or 17, 16 or 17? No, it was later. It was 17 oh, okay. uh, at the earliest, earliest. Yeah. And then um, our temple actually uh, was uh, is a slightly different case. Our temple uh, was is part of the problem is of course also that our temple is tends to attract pro democracy followers, but our temple in fact is usually doesn't express its opinion very much. There's actually a lot of different opinions. Even when, when you talk about democracy versus uh, traditional uh, Thai politics, um, that is not really, our temple doesn't really have a clear opinion about that, whether official or unofficial. You find people who are both uh, okay with some level of uh, government, for example, half democ democratic, half not democratic, like Sri like uh, not um, like uh, Singapore, for example, uh, you know, not fully. There's a lot of Thai monks, uh, Thai people are okay with that. Uh, also in our temple, but then there are also people in our temple who are very progressive in their views. So it's both. But the thing that we became noticeable about is that we attracted the attention of Taksin Chinawatra at that time. He became involved in an education project, a temple, and he actually talked, gave his opinion about the project. He praised the project in public, coming to our temple in public, not to join a ceremony or of some kind, but to praise this education project. So this was uh, perceived as, uh, that's why our temple, after the Taksin was overthrown and uh, there was a military junta uh, then of course we were like the enemy number one because we had the actual the actual man talking inside of our temple uh, in front of television <laughs> about uh, how education and meditation could be combined or something like that uh, he, he talked about the uh, similar teams so yeah we became the target Okay, that's 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 not a difficult natural consequence, yeah. <laughs> kind of a natural consequence, uh, and um, so that's that's really. Uh, I don't think uh, you could say that our temple is wretched or something like that, because there is a lot uh, that uh, many people in our temple wouldn't be comfortable with supporting, as it come when it comes to the wretched movement uh, which took place, uh, which which uh, there's a lot of differences between Damakai and Red Shirt. So that's politics for you. But the, the short story is that um, when you are big, you know, you become a source of opinion. Uh, then you become a place where people come together. Uh, even those who are not part of the temple, not part of the staff of the temple, not part of the monks, but they come to the temple to talk. You know, if you have uh, 10 Bangkok businessmen coming to the temple to talk, that's not a big thing. But if there are 100 and 200 and all of them seem to be kind of pro-democracy oriented, <laughs> then you kind of like, like you, you, you know, don't shoot the messenger, you know. <laughs> it's, it's, we, don't, we don't really uh, support that, but, but then these people, there's a lot of people coming to our temple who are kind of progressive in their thoughts. So we kind of were perceived as uh, as uh, as uh, supporting uh, pro democracy movement in Thailand and uh, supporting the red shirt movement. Uh, but uh, the most clear uh, thing that they really hated or didn't like about us, the military junta, and still don't like, is the fact that uh, Taksin came to our temple. He, in fact, he had a meeting. He had a, he organized one of his uh, political conferences in our temple. Now, to be honest, to be to give you the full story, very few monks and staff of our temple joined the meeting. There were just a few people making sure that everything ran smoothly. We just gave the venue, you know, it was the assembly hall. The people came to December, we cleaned it for them and then they came there, that's it. But yeah, that kind of uh, 
puts you in as a political target to to, <laughs> to say, well, Taksin is welcome to have his political conference here in in our temple. You know, <laughs> so, yeah, that was. Um, but like I said, our temple is very courageous. It does uh, a lot of things that are uh, sometimes considered politically dangerous. Right. Not because we are politically biased or have any favors or fears, but we are simply um, working with a lot of people. And at a certain point, you become noticeable. If you are also a wealthy temple, then you also become noticeable. Now, I, think yeah. I, sh I should say that our temple, temple's wealth is, is heavily overstated. I mean... I really have the experience uh, for a long time already in the temple that every dime is negotiated all the time. So, so uh, if there is any wealth, then it's mostly the supporters who come to the temple and want to support something. But as soon as the as the money becomes part of the temple's uh, yeah, um, uh, finances, you know, the people who manage that, then it's like. You cannot easily uh, use it for anything without careful consideration. Uh, it's, it's, it's always a lot of discussion about how we uh, use the money that people have given with their devotion, how we use it in the most careful manner. So that's, that's the culture that I grew up with as a monk. And uh, I've never seen anything else. The, the well, Dhammakaya temple, uh, the, the, the whole... The whole temple in in Thailand is how many kilometers by kilometers, is it? Oh, that's a good question. <laughs> it's huge. I, I, I'm not very good at stats. <laughs> well, anyways, this this this, this is one of the largest. It's, it's more than a more. I mean, if you talk about the Chediya, it's already uh, uh, about a kilometer in size. So yes, in in diameter diameter and it's it's very large yeah. yeah it's it's a it's a few kilometers length and width it's it's, the, it's a the massive entire country. yes yeah it's it's a massive massive complex and yeah. how many monks are are at how many monks and nuns uh upasika are there most of the time we have about a thousand uh, and a little bit more thousand three hundred thousand two hundred if you count the novices more and uh, um, there is a lot of uh, female, uh, uh, yeah, uh, female staff, upasika, who are living more or less as nuns, and uh, they they also number in the thousand. Yeah. Okay, and, so that, and, and that, that is not even talking about the huge number of volunteers who come right. uh, and do not live in the temple, but they come to the temple. And uh, this is a village. And that's and what I come to know at our temple as a village where you live. Um, the, the, recent, the recent scandal or the, the recent uh, situation with the abbot having to, having to go into hiding and um, the raid, the raid on, on the temple in, in 2017, um, where the the DSI, which is the equivalent to the FBI in, in the United States, showed up and and pretty much raided the temple. What was the reason behind all of this? Because it got quite a lot of media attention at the time, even here in the United States. Uh, yeah, so that was uh, mostly part of the detoxination program that uh, that the military junta wanted to to do. So they really wanted to get rid of our temple. So. Um, there was um, there were some donations given to our temple, and they didn't check out. So the the, the origin of those donations, uh, there were many many donations, uh, but all from the same person. But many uh, these donations they didn't check out. So he it turned out he had used uh, he embezzled he had embezzled money, and then gave it to our temple. He also gave it to other causes, by the way. He was a very generous wow. man. Yeah, he was a very generous man. But the th the thing is that uh, those that money wasn't legally obtained. So the the government at that time they dismissed us because they didn't charge us for that because we were we were the recipient, and the money had already been spent on buildings. 
and there was there was uh, we yeah that we weren't charged with anything because uh, the, the 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 damage had already been done the the money had already been stolen and it was already given and had already been spent. But uh, as soon as the junta came into power, they they revived the case. And uh, this is a process that they have done in many cases. They revived certain cases. They picked certain cases to 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 get to be able to control somebody politically. Uh, and so they picked this case and they said, uh, "You had the intention." That's what they said to us to launder the money. And their evidence was that the the person who had given those donations was on a first name basis with our abbot. Now, that is not very much much of evidence, and the problem with that evidence is that it was it was also obtained in prison. But okay, well, if wow. we put that aside, then then still it's it's a bit it's not a very clear case. But they said okay, that's enough to charge our abbot with laundering money. There must have been a personal relation with the man who gave the donation, and he probably. You know, after the money was laundered, he then would come to receive the, that money again from our temple and and use it for something legal, uh, something like that. That was the theory. That has never really been investigated, but it was enough for them to charge our abbot with the consequence that our abbot has not been in public uh, since that time. So, um, so that's what makes it very difficult and uh, even uh, uh, yeah even now we we our temple is still uh, you know we still have these uh, accusations that are that have not been dropped yet so there is a legal case still running would you would you go as far as to say that that um the dsi has taken you know, tactical intelligence measures against against the temple. You know, in the, in the United States, if there's a large growing organization that the government is worried about, they, they implant their own people in the organization to get intelligence. And if it ends up being a problem, they, they eventually take it down. The FBI did this to the Black Panthers group in the United States in the, uh, I think, late 60s and early 70s. Would you go as far as to say that sort of thing has happened at, at the temple or you're not allowed to, you don't think you should speak on that? You know, I, I don't have any uh, evidence that that happened, mm. but uh, and I don't know if that happened. Uh, frankly, I've never heard of it. Uh, but there have been cases when uh, journalists uh, would—I uh, wouldn't say journal journalists, but uh, paparazzi sent uh, people to to come and report on our temple. So these these people would sometimes even uh, join activities or even become a volunteer full time, and then report to paparazzi. But that's just paparazzi; it's not a big thing. It's just, okay, it's not a sort of uh, main uh, mainstream uh, journalism, and it happened a long time ago, mostly in the nineties. Uh, apart from that, I don't think uh, the junta ever did sort of that kind of things. Uh, but there's one case where they put a. a um, car put a car next to a temple and actually put some drugs in it, and then claimed that it was our the car of the temple, but it wasn't in the temple. So, so there was a few paparazzi uh, newspapers that picked up on it, but it, they couldn't get any evidence, so it, it it dropped. It was only one. It was in the news on one day, <laughs> and then it you know it was just. You, you, they, they, it was an old trick, and they couldn't do that anymore because Thailand has now developed uh, a lot more than than in previous times. So, so that would that didn't work. So, but that that kind of things they did do, yeah. But they, I don't think they actually infiltrated our temple. Mm -hmm. But you know, even then, I'm I'm pretty sure that our abbot would just say, "Well, let them see it." You know, let them see. <laughs> you know. He actually literally said that when the when when. Paparazzi newspapers sent people to to find uh, damaging information on our temple uh, during the late nineties. Our abbot actually said, "Let them let them see," you know. Yeah, nothing and, to hide. Uh, the temple. I know this because one of those people who was uh, on a payroll by a paparazzi newspaper uh, tabloid. 
uh, was uh, later he confessed to me during a discussion that he was um, previously working for uh, a paparazzi uh, like that. But uh, later he changed his mind and he very much regretted what he had done. And uh, wow. at that time he was ordained. Oh. <laughs> But yeah, wow. he was just ordained temporarily as a sort of, you know, how it goes in Thai Buddhism, a sort of three month uh, training as a monk and then people disrobe. It's a sort of novi novice actually. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, he, he did confess that. He, he only confessed it when we were having like a real, you know, discussion monks among each other and, and we were really getting to know each other. You know, we were monks, so we weren't drunk. But if if people in the world want to have a comparison, it, it's, it's like we are, you know, man speaking amongst each other and, and telling each other stories. So we we were doing that in the way monastics do that. So very politely and without alcohol. <laughs> so so and then he said, "You did you know I have some secret that I would like to share because a lot of people were telling very private things." And then he said, I would like to, actually, I've been on a payroll from uh, by a paparazzi newspaper. Actually, there isn't such a word in Thai, but we, we you can understand from the context. Uh, so it was a newspaper that, that actually uh, gave him money to find damaging information about a temple. So these kind of things really happen in Thailand. It's not just fairy tales. So. But uh, yeah, our abbot, he would just say, yeah, come and see. Now there's another thing uh, which kind of uh, connects with what you were saying, that uh, some people um, um, compare our situation, especially people from America who do not know Thailand very well, some people, uh, they compare it with an uh, organization called Weco or something. Don't know the exact name, a religious oh, organization. Oh, Waco? Waco, yeah, sorry. <laughs> yeah, not comparable. So, that's very different comparable. because yeah, the, the, we we were uh, we are not isolated like a cult group or something. We are uh, very much in the midst of the monastic establishment even today. Uh, after all the accusations of the, it's like in Holland, uh, uh, all the temples they connect with each other, talk with each other. There's there's continuous conversation. There's not uh, we are not an isolated religious group. Uh, and um, yeah, well. There is no violence. We we actually we are faced with a lot of violence uh, during the last uh, times when the junta actually um, tried to get our abbot. They came in with 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 many uh, with a task force consisting of both police and army, and uh, these were about fifty to hundred people or something, and they came in and then uh, we we. Our abbot actually taught everyone to chant the first teaching of the Buddha, because it's 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 a nice chant and it keeps you in in meditation. It keeps you in a meditative mood. So we just chanted this all the time, you know. And then you know when they came, we what you're gonna do to a, to a chanting crowd? We are which are chanting very nice Buddhist texts. You know you can't you can't just hit them or something. You know so that that helped a lot. So we never engaged into violence. We've always diffused it rather. I don't know if this is uh, answering your question. <laughs> oh, I, oh it, it, it definitely is. And, and with the, there's a particular um, monk who is very close. I can't even recall his name, but there was a particular monk who was really close with the abbot and he ended up, uh, he was a monk for many, many years at a temple. He he left and became a university professor. And um, after he disrobed and just despairs the temple um, entirely. Do you think that that sort of thing is a is a natural occurrence, or do you think that people can get compromised by by political actors? Yeah, that that is is it's it's possible that uh, some people uh, living in the temple. Uh, may get into, you know, we are not enlightened. Uh, sometimes things happen, maybe sometimes conflicts ask, cause people to leave uh, the monkhood, uh, may be possible. But uh, we have to understand that in this case, the person that you're mentioning now, uh, who was previously a monk in our temple, 
he was uh, actually uh, he was you know he was he was paid or he was at least we don't know exactly how much and to what extent he was paid by the junta but uh, there is uh, he was actually put into uh, onto the team of um, of a religious uh, innovation committee of the military junta in uh, in about 2014 or something when the military junta took over thailand uh, he was actually part of that team so he was very much in directly in connection with the uh, so there's some journalists who do not know that information so they just in interview him and ask him what he thinks about our temple well, well, he was he was actually you know he was given the assignment to 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 find a way to to uh, renovate Buddhism more according to the lines of uh, the military junta. So part of that was removing all traces from uh, Taksin, Chinawat, and uh, our temple had some traces <laughs> because he came to our temple uh, as I mentioned, but. Uh but you know, I, I I don't make that much of it. I mean, it's not like we are politically that much involved or something. It, we are pretty much aloof, actually. And what is the? I I recall I recall you telling me that the the actually the the abbot of Wat Pak Nam, which is the the grandfather temple uh, to the Damakai temple, Lung, that was Long Pu's temple, the rediscoverer of the technique. That the current abbot there is actually supposed to be the the head of the Thai Thai Bhikkhu Council, but for whatever reason, he's he's not. Um, mm. Could you explain that? Yeah. So so this is this is a very uh, similar uh, occurrence. So there was a, um, there is a tendency in uh, in when Thailand gets politically um, uh, less stable that uh, the government, especially military governments. They, you know, they will try to influence the politics of uh, monastic establishment as well, and they preferred uh, another monk, which was uh, he was, you know, that the monk that you mentioned, the current abbot of uh, Wat Pak Nam, he. Um, Somdet Chuan, correct? So Somdet Chuan, Somdet Rajamankalajan. He was uh, at that time. Uh, he was. Um, um, he was part of the monastic uh, uh, top, the monastic top, and uh, he did a lot of good work. And so they, according to his seniority, he should have been the head of the, the Sangharacha or the head of the monastic establishment. But um, the, the, the military junta preferred another person. So they came in and interfered. But you know how monks sometimes can be when it comes to politicians telling them what to do. You know they didn't really want to do what uh, military junta told them. So uh, they said, "Well, the oldest person is he, so he has to be the, the the leading monk of the monastic establishment, even if you don't like him." So um, so they, and then they they came up with this bogus accusation. There's a, there's a museum in the temple in Wat Pak Nam, and uh, a few years ago, uh, about 2014, 2013, around that period, Wat Pak Nam actually made an announcement in the newspapers that they wanted, uh, if people wanted to donate things for the museum, they could, because then people would have an extra reason to come to the temple and... <clears throat> And uh, it's a bit odd if we if you think about it, but um, uh, some people also donated old cars, you know, just to very you know, very old ones that are extremely old, old expensive. That, uh, yeah, some journalist has you know journalist on the. It depends on which political side the journalist is. Some journalist will say it's a it's a wreck. <laughs> And the other journalist will say it's an expensive uh, car, <laughs> depending on which side uh, the journalist is on. <laughs> so um, there's this old car, which cannot be used anymore, an old timer, which is offered to the temple and it's put in the museum. And uh, yeah, so it turns out that this car was actually bought. 
it was bought, even though it couldn't be driven anymore, but it was bought. And there was uh, some accusation that there was uh, no tax paid on it. Now, before the junta came into power, this was a little, it was also in the news, just a short moment. But, you know, it was like, uh, okay, they had to, to, to maybe find out if the tax had to be paid later on. You know, it, it was like, uh, it wasn't a big thing. And then the junta came and said, <laughs> they used the exact same method that they used with our abbot. And they said, oh, okay, we're going to revive that case. And we're going to want to ask a lot of questions about that, that particular car. Wow. Uh, and then... Uh, yeah, uh, and some that Paracha Mangalachan, he's very, he's a, he was traditionally raised uh, as, a, as a novice in the temple. He was in the monastic life from a young, very young age. So he, he's, he's not a very political, savvy man or something like that. He's mostly a very, just a very good monk with a very, uh, a very diligent uh, intention to to help him develop Buddhism, but he's not a political actor or something. So he simply says, "Well, well, if that car is a problem, then we just give it to the government. There you are," <laughs> which only made it worse. <laughs> so 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 uh, so eventually, it turns out that the car wasn't bought by some that Chuan, some that Parachamankalachan. So they couldn't charge him because he didn't buy it himself. There was another monk who was involved in receiving that car from a donor. And so they charged him instead. Wow. And eventually that accusation just keep on, keep on running. And they said all the time, yeah, we, the prosecutor would say, yeah, we need to find more, more information. We cannot do the lawsuit yet. We need to postpone and find more information. So they postponed, 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 and eventually the military junta said, yeah, with all these cases coming on, there was only one case, but with all these political cases, you know, we cannot, uh, <laughs> we cannot have this monk become the head of the monastic establishment. That would be crazy. You know, even some, some newspapers in other countries like Singapore or Malaysia, they fell for this. They, act, they completely went along with it. But uh, anyway, uh, most uh, many Thai newspapers, they were very skeptical. They knew that this was a bit fishy. So um, the pro-democracy newspapers who were kind of against the military junta, they, you know, they kind of felt it was very fishy and very, very, very odd. Eventually, it turned out that uh, the monk who received the uh, the car he was not they they could there was evidence they could find no evidence that he was aware that the car had not been that no tax had been paid on the car this was the specific issue that was that was that the, he was charged with so he wasn't aware that the donor had not paid tax on the car so so the case was dropped and in order just to make sure what Paknam and there, they had a, like I said, they were not politically savvy, but they did have a very good lawyer. And the lawyer, he then said, we're going to sue them back. So this happened only, uh, I think only a year ago or something, maybe two years ago, yeah, two years ago. So they sued them back because they wanted to make sure that, you know, a military junta, they sometimes keep information so they can always get you later. Mm. So they wanted to make sure that all the information was on the table. So they sued them back for malicious prosecution. And then the junta, they said, well, you know, we're going to settle. We're not going to pursue this anymore, which, which is odd because they could, you know, they have much more means than what Paknam has. So eventually the case was settled. and they said they made a promise that they were not ever going to, uh, to, to revive the case anymore. So this was the end of it, but some that uh, some that Paracha Mankalajan was not selected as a, as the head of the sangha. So this is a kind of a political game, but personally, I think it's much worse and a much more serious case that the military junta in Thailand uh, has has now has well 
they're not strictly a military junta anymore, but you know, the military yeah. <laughs> junta is still, it's still, it's still, it's still not very functioning democracy. So right now, um, I think it's worse that they have chosen to um, to now um, to now have. Uh, uh, n there's according to many interpretations right now, the military junta can now select every member of the monastic establishment. So uh, okay, that's not what they say. They say we leave it up to the king. Okay, but in in our understanding, we think probably it's mostly the military junta who makes this decision. So this is much worse, even I think, than than trying to uh, determine who is the head. I mean, even just selecting every member of the monastic establishment, uh, top of the monastic establishment, is now selected by the military junta. So, so that is just uh, showing that it goes, you know, it continues and continues and. So um, yeah, that is uh, the the problem is not that the military junta is uh, is I don't think the problem main problem is that they influence Thai politics. The main problem is that they they paralyze it. Mm. But they cause the monastic establishment not to function as it should, which causes Buddhism not to be taught. It causes it to to you know, it causes it not to work as it should, as it was intended to work. So, so it's not that they uh, ask monks to dress up as military officers or something. No, of course not. They might not even change that much, but it causes our temple uh, and uh, the monastic establishment not to work properly as intended. Yeah. So that's what happens. And, uh, yeah, well, you can be angry about it, but that's just, uh, I guess, uh, they just want to make sure that everything's stable. So that's what they do in their perspective. <laughs> in their is, there, is there any hope in the next few years for this uh, junta to go away and for the abbot to to be able to reemerge? What is, what is your perspective on that? I, I don't know. I don't know. Um, wow. The we 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 may not know exactly where the abbot is, but we do know his age, and uh, he's getting older now. And uh, so so what we what we have to do now is uh, we we try to in our temple we try to do all the good things that he has set out. He would like everyone in the world to learn about meditation. And uh, and he would like every everyone in the world, to, you know, to learn about uh, Buddhism. They don't have to be Buddhist, but they learn about it. And uh, that's what we do. We teach ourselves and we teach uh, others. <laughs> so that's the best way to 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 you know to to continue this his uh, Machayo's intentions. To meditate a lot by yourself and to teach others. <laughs> and uh, what what do you think is the the future of the uh, the Dhammakaya tradition in the context of um, of Western Theravada Buddhism? Difficult because uh, um, we have very good intentions to try to convey these teachings to the West. But uh, there's a lot of cultural differences. Um, I think it's more likely that we can see a certain, to some extent, secular version. Uh, a lot of people learning about Dhammakaya meditation without the full package of Thai Buddhism. And then there will be a number of people who want to know the entire teaching. Right. Similarly to what happened to Goenka becoming mainstream mindfulness and becoming as what some people call mech mindfulness, and that is a bit, a bit unfair, but, um, you know, becoming more widely available in a more secular form. And sometimes there is no other way in a, in a modern democracy because if you want uh, 
in the in the in many schools or in public schools or in in uh, in in government or sim semi government uh, semi government uh, institutions you want to have meditation have a have a role in there you you need to present it you need, it needs to be secular it needs to be uh, accepted by it can be accepted by anyone from any religion so i think that what we have seen the huge uh, rise of research about meditation, uh, as we discussed previously before we had uh, before we started to broadcast, the huge rise of research about meditation, which has gone from one one which kind of became ten times or twenty times as much as as in as ten years ago or twenty years ago. So it's a lot more and a lot more accepted, widely accepted mainstream. Um, that is only a tip of the iceberg. Right. Because most of that re research was done uh, using the mindfulness as done by the method of John Kabat-Zinn most of the time. And that's only one method based on mostly Goenka and, and, and some Sri Lankan uh, teachers. Uh, but... Uh, that is only one part of the story. So there's the tip of the iceberg that is about to come up and uh, we will soon learn that we are learning about a lot of things, uh, a lot of patterns, a lot of parts of the brain that we never knew about before because of meditation. And uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure about that uh, because what I see happening now and my experience with teaching uh, people who have practiced mindfulness before is that they feel that mindfulness prepares them for Dhammakaya meditation. And then Dhammakaya meditation deepens it. I'm not saying mindfulness is wrong or, or not important. I'm just saying that, uh, that many people come to me and tell me that they find that it has deepened, Dhammakaya meditation has deepened that practice and they uh, they they feel it's it's going very deep it's one of the deepest methods in the sense that it gives you a profound sense of calm and uh, a sense of wholeness that uh, and I, I i think i'm inclined to believe that that can be found in many buddhist methods but i think this method our method is very intuitive and direct and that appeals to many people who like the simple nature. Like in the words of Long Pu, yut bentu a samatha, right? So still, uh, stand still, that is meditation. Mm. And, and, and that, that if, if, we, if we really come to explain that at a deep level, then people really appreciate that very much. Fantastic, fantastic. Well. Well, Pete, before we before we end our our conversation, are there any final final words of uh, of wisdom or anything you would like to share before we close out? Well, we've covered many things, and uh, I think um, yeah, I think there is a lot to learn. And when I look back at the life of Lompu, I'm so impressed. I'm so much impressed. Uh, we are about to celebrate um, uh, his his life on the third of February, on the Teachers' Day, uh, and um, I'm so impressed um, by the fact that he was always learning and, and 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 trying out many meditation methods and trying to learn what he could from every teacher, and if everyone in the world would just simply have this this learning attitude, uh, there is always a lot we can learn and improve ourselves on. Then I think uh, meditation can, pro can give us many things. And um, I'm just happy to hear that there is a lot of discussion and interest in meditation and the different traditions. And I hope uh, we can combine our efforts. Uh, I'd like to close with an example. In Holland, we have a website uh, right now. Uh, I won't advertise it but it's a website which is a combined effort by many meditation teachers, including Dhammakaya. And uh, we have uh, many meditation teachers teaching, to get, teaching 
at different times together on the same website. Uh, and uh, many people can just select the ones that appeal to them. And that's that's uh, such a nice way to do that, you know. And, and, uh, and you're, you're, on, you're on it as well, correct? Yeah, I'm on it as well. Okay, you, you could share it. That's fine. What's the, no, the I, website I, name? I prefer not to share because oh, okay. we can share it in the info box or something. But th gotcha. that's not the reason. I, I mainly wanted to give the example. Most people who are listening to this broadcast won't benefit from it because it's in Dutch. <laughs> so, so, so that's uh, that's just an example of uh, how we can work together, and uh, and we can emphasize that uh, even though we are in a difficult age, and we are still have a long process to go before we get rid of the COVID, you know, we can use this time, and we can use this energy to practice and learn about meditation as much as we can. Wonderful, wonderful. Long, long piece, Sander. Thank you so much for your time. I, I really appreciate appreciate your wisdom, and everyone here on the show, I'm sure, will be uh, very impressed with with all the. <laughs> it's a, a long story, but it's important because these are all questions that that people ask, and I, I just thank you so much for for giving us a full, a, a more complete perspective on on things related to our technique and to our temple. You're welcome. I was I feel uh, honored to have been invited. I really uh, like your uh, what, what, what shall I call it broadcast your series of broadcasts, and uh, I very very much enjoy it. And uh, I think you're doing a very great job. And I'm happy to that we can meet uh, every now and then. Uh, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. We'll we'll, we'll have we'll have you back in a couple months, surely, to to discuss more dhamma. So. Thank, thank you very much, Lopi Sander, and talk to you soon. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me over.